Hello, you all. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Governance and Analytics, Crafting a Data-Driven Future, sponsored today by Precisely. And just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A portion. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And if you haven't noticed, we have cameras on today. A little bit different format for you. Our precisely, our precisely speakers will give a brief introduction, then I will come back in and moderate some questions submitted by Precisely in a panel format. Then I'll facilitate a Q&A from the attendees as normal at the end of the presentation. And again, because we, if this is a panel, we wanted to turn cameras on so y'all can see who's talking. Now, let me introduce you our Precisely speakers for today. Uh, we Today, we have Hafiz Chet and Sean Connolly. Hafiz is the Vice President of Strategic Technologies at Precisely. He leads a team of data domain experts and technology architects who leverage emerging technologies to develop innovative products and solutions that drive growth and deliver business value to their customers. He has over 24 years of professional experience leading cross-functional teams in the areas of product management, research and development, sales engineering, and solution architecture. At present, he is at the forefront of developing innovative solutions that drive business value and growth by leveraging emerging trends such as data mesh, data fabric, knowledge graph, generative AI, data access governance, and AI governance. Very fun, very cool. Sean is a principal strategic services consultant at Precisely with a global supply chain and data background from over 25 years of working with data-centric industry leaders like Apple and Hewlett Packard. Sean is extremely passionate about de delivering real-world game-changing solutions <laughs> for customers. And now let me try to give a brief introduction of the webinar, and then I will join back to moderate a few questions. Sean, hello and welcome. Hey, great. Appreciate Thanks, Sean. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so so I, I want to start by, I think I clicked one too many times. Uh, so I'll tell everybody a little bit about Precisely and um, I uh, kind of joke that uh, at times people ask me who I work for, and I'm like, precisely. And they're like, are you going to tell me who you work for? I'm like, precisely. So we're actually a company that's grown over the years uh, through acquisition. I was actually acquired twice. Um, but we really believe in data integrity. So we uh, were kind of marked as the leader in data integrity. Uh, we believe that better decisions uh, come from better data. And that's why precisely empowers organizations kind of all over the world including 99 of the Fortune 100 companies um, to really kind of build trust in their data. Uh, we believe that in order to uh, for data to be trustworthy, it's got to be accurate, it's got to be consistent, it's got to be contextual. It's got to be um, built for the business purpose, um, and we call that data integrity. So we've got decades of domain experience. The company was actually founded back in like 1969. Um, and again, through acquisitions has grown. And now we have a unique combination of consulting services, software um, and data, enriched data that we work with clients all over the world uh, to help them on their journey of data integrity. So that's kind of a little bit about who we are. And if we kind of move forward here. Um, so yeah, we're happy to talk about data, data governance and, and data and analytics specifically. And, and I thought this was interesting because recent studies have come out, you know, like what are people really doing with data and analytics and what's driving. And obviously we've all heard about AI and what's going on there. Um, but interestingly enough, 91% of organizations are investing in AI. My guess is probably that's pretty close to the, um, I don't know if you guys on the call are investing, but 91% um, seem to be investing in anything from chatbots to AI, kind of all of the things that you um, would expect them to be investing in. So chances are you are investing in AI, but interestingly enough, you know, I'd be curious to know, um, and Gartner actually did a, resource, uh, a, a survey and their IT symposium found that the, revealed that only 4% of participants in the survey reported that their data, and I, uh, data is AI ready. 
So this is a self-reported metric. So when I report about myself, if I'm reporting bad things, I'm probably even more conservative. So chances are it's actually probably higher than that. But the fact that only 4% of the participants said their data is AI ready, um, I think that's probably pretty consistent with it. Do we feel like our data is ready across the organization? Um, and what happens when data is not AI ready? You know, we see uh, uh, inaccurate predictions. We see uh, biases, hallucinations. Um, and there's a ton of time spent on data and preparation. So um, this challenge has been going on a long time, actually. I've been kind of in the data world for a number of years. And um, in like the mid 2000s, so 2010, 11, 12, 13 ish, um, I helped a large company in Europe build out their data program. And we were delivering everything from basic reporting and metrics to analytics to a very detailed profitability um, and analytics engine. And these were kind of the early days for data governance and machine learning and data science. And we had built um, a team covering everything from quality to MDM to governance, analytics, and we even had some data scientists back in the day. Um, and I'll tell you, it's amazing how much you can pay data scientists to end up finding data, cleaning data, integrating data, and hopefully do some more of the fun stuff. But it's expensive and frustrating, and AI just sort of ups the ante to that. So it is a real challenge if our data and is ready for um, analytics, and certainly if it's not ready for AI. It's just kind of an exponential challenge. And so the business impacts are, you know, unfortunately can be widely publicized. I mean, I worked with a European transport company that had in inaccurate data um, for their profitability analytics, and that led to pricing decisions that were wrong. And it also led to the wrong incentives for the drivers that they had. Um, I think it's, you know, you can go out and Google it, but there's uh, an HR recruiting application that prioritized applications for men. There was a tutoring company that uh, automatically rejected women 55 or older, a uh, healthcare algorithm that failed to prioritize certain um, uh, races of patients. I mean, all of this stuff is what results from bad data. And so um, I think this topic is very timely and very germane to probably everybody that's on the call. So, but I wanna talk about something I've gotten a little bit passionate about. Um, I went up to my sister's house. I live in Kansas City. She lives in Omaha and on the way up, um, several of the big companies are building data centers and they're building data centers because of AI. And the challenge is, is that when business people think about running models or when some of your data scientists run models, uh, we think, oh, well, if it's wrong, it doesn't give us the right result. If we need to add more data, we'll just run it again. Well, the environmental impact of AI is not talked about very often, but it's monstrous. And it, at this point, you know, historically we've said that um, not having well-governed data and not having accurate data is kind of a problem for businesses like we kind of already know and talked about, mm -hmm. but not having good data and running um, AI is uh, irresponsible. So the amount of data that, uh, that, well, it's not just the amount of data, but really it's the processing as well, right? So, I mean, just to have uh, the bottom one where BCG said the data center share of the U.S. electrical consumption is expected to triple by 2030. I mean, that's adding 40 million <laughs> U.S. homes. That's the equivalent of. So, yes, there's business impact, but, you know, I'm getting more and more passionate about that we are, it is irresponsible to not have good data governance, good information um, to feed our AI uh, models as well. So that's a significant um, impact. But, you know, the thing is, it's not easy, right? So the average tenure, I don't know if you guys know this, but the average tenure for a CDO or CDAO is under two years. And the reason it's under ten, two years, it's Gartner will tell you that, you know, uh, it's hard to de deliver sustainable value and it's hard to do it fast enough. Um, there's so much of the sort of unsexy that has to be done first, right? We have to govern our data. We have to have owners of our data. We have to do all this stuff. And CDAOs tend to struggle to address the aspects of governance that are really going to make a difference for an organization to really accelerate what's going on. And so I do a ton of work internationally. Most of my region is actually, um, I'm responsible for international strategic services. And the things that I hear all the time from uh, people as I do uh, events, whether it's an AI event, whether it's event, governance events, or just kind of data strategy, 
we hear these kind of things all the time. Oh, I push too many buttons. So we hear, you know, like leadership is pushing AI, but they really don't understand the complexity that's involved. I don't even know where to get started. It's great that everybody's running towards AI, but you know, what do I do? How do I get started? I'm struggling to articulate the value of data. Um, so the things kind of listed here are the things that I hear like literally all the time when I go to conferences and when I go talk to clients, this, these are the types of things that I hear. I would say that very few organizations are actually, they have their data dialed and they're ready to move on to the future. In fact, I would argue that the companies that I have seen um, are, are the most advanced, are the organizations that tend to have been founded in the cloud. So I talked to a digital bank and they were, they were founded as digital. They've been around for only like three to five years and they actually are pretty good with their data. Beyond that, if companies have been founded for a long time or are brick and mortar, more traditional industries really struggle with their data and to make these leaps into AI and accelerate their data programs is a real challenge. So this is my attempt at uh, talking, when I talk to data, uh, well, when I talk to leaders, um, data leaders get leadership and organization, they tend to not really understand the problem. So the way I articulate it is very clearly that, you know, your data is a little bit like a supply chain, not exactly because things, data continues to move around and live in our organization. It doesn't just start and end, right? But if we think about it in terms of there's kind of a supply side and a demand side, when data sits in our transactional systems, when it sits in its original system, it actually looks pretty good. So if you think about Legos, it's like, you know, when, when customer information sits in your CRM, pretty good customer information. But we start to move that around and start to add account information and all sorts of other things, do analytics on it, do transformation, and it becomes more complicated. So it's a little bit like a Lego Jeep. And for my son to build that Jeep when there are only Legos in that box where the Jeep Legos, it's pretty easy, right? So it takes him a little bit of time, puts it together, boom, and he's got a Lego Jeep together. The problem is, you know, it's like asking when leadership asks you a question and says, hey, can you give me a report on this? They have no idea how long it took. They have no idea that it took, you know, 10 people, 10 hours to put this information together because the data has gotten everywhere. And it's gotten everywhere because it's like my son and his Jeep. Once he finished that Lego Jeep and uh, let it sit on a shelf for a day or two, uh, he would take that Lego Jeep and break it apart and throw it into a bin with all of his other Legos. And so as organizations start to move their data around, you know, we went from data warehouses to data lakes to data swamps. Um, and, and so really figuring out what data we have, where it is, becomes quite messy. So then I think about the Jeep again. And if you asked me to make the Jeep out of that Lego bin, that would be a nightmare. It would take me way longer. I couldn't have a lot of confidence that I had the right wheels or the right parts to the Jeep, right? So what we do in an organization, and what you guys do as data leaders, is we know that we have to do that heavy lifting for our data. We have to have data integrity operations. We have to understand in business terms, um, what is that data? Where is it? Data lineage, data quality. We have to do engineering and prep. We have to do modeling. We have to do all these things. It's kind of hard work, but leadership doesn't really understand that. When we do that hard work, we get our data in such a way that we understand what it is, where it is, where it came from. We understand when it's of good quality. We can do things for the business significantly faster. We can have confidence in our data products. We can deliver metrics, reporting, and analytics. We can do data science. And if we want to start doing AI, perhaps the only things we need to add are more contextual data to improve the accuracy and reduce hallucinations and bias of our AI models. So if I go back to the Jeep, it's way easier for me to make the Jeep now again, because I know I have all the parts. But if business asked me to make a pink Jeep, I'd look at my data, aka my Legos, and I'd say, I don't have pink Legos. And so I may need to acquire Legos. But I could do, and, and essentially acquire data, but I could do things really quickly. Now, if the business asks me to build a helicopter, no problem. I know I've got blue ones. I know I've got the right parts. Um, I could build a ship. I could build kind of whatever the business wants to. So precisely as a whole, we have built out capabilities and I lead strategic services internationally. And so we talk to clients about these types of capabilities that are required to ensure that our data is well cared for, business ready, um, and ultimately ready for data and analytics on the other side. Um, so these capabilities are required for organizations to do that. And from a services perspective, that's kind of what we do is we help 
enable clients, whether it's from data strategy, doing assessments, enablement, change management. We do that for clients kind of all over the world. So um, strategic services, uh, just real briefly on what we do. We do, like I mentioned, we do data strategy. We do a lot of value realization. Um, I think the thing we're most proud about, this isn't intended to be a commercial, but we're most proud of the fact that we're um, 100% referenceable. So any client we've worked for in strategic services, we can give you somebody to talk to. But you know, overall the data journey is pretty complex and it's ongoing and everybody's starting at a different place. And so Precisely has put together a suite of capabilities um, and strategic services. We kind of meet clients where they are and we help you along the way um, with whether it's services uh, that are agnostic. So I work with a lot of clients that have none of our capabilities to clients that have several or many of them, um, but that's kind of what we help um, clients do. So Teradata tends to be a trusted partner for data integrity. Um, we have a ton of experience. Like I said, we've been around since 1969. Um, we've acquired companies that you would know and, and have heard of, and we have a pretty, pretty comprehensive suite of products to help. Um, and we always are driving for business impact. So like she said in my uh, opening, really passionate about making a difference. Uh, I used to have a lot more hair, uh, now I have less and more gray. Um, I just feel like we don't have a lot of time to mess around. Like, let's just get on with it and make a difference for our clients. So that's kind of what we do. And uh, so, yeah, I think I'll turn it back over to Shannon and she can walk us through some questions. Oh, Sean, thank you so much. I can so relate to that Lego analogy. I just having flashbacks back to that big box of chaos. Um, well, I can and you totally can imagine step, stepping on them with bare feet, right? That was oh, like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least put them in the bin for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah. Trying to find that one piece that you need. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's dive in here. I, I want to bring in uh, Hasif, Hafiz. Sorry, and, um, and let's get some, into some questions here. So, what are some emerging considerations around data and analytics programs? Well, so I'll kick it off and say that maybe a better question is like, what's not changing? I mean, but seriously, we're experiencing you know just these rapid advancements and capabilities from a technical standpoint. And there's also this pro proliferation of data from all sorts of uh, devices like smartphones and vehicles, as well as like assets are, you know, certainly kind of internet of things was a buzzword some time ago um, on equipment and vehicles and all that. Um, even the taps and bottles and bars, I don't know if you guys noticed, but they've got sensors on them and they're measuring how much is getting poured. Are we getting overserved or underserved, you know, kind of in a shot, if you will. Um, but that also helps with reordering requirements and those kinds of things. So, so this is driving the requirement for real-time analytics. Um, again, it's not necessarily new, but I think it's really accelerating. And LLMs really need, you know, enriched data. Um, they need to, we really need to understand the requirement when we need to acquire more data. I mean, it's really quite a challenge to think about um, keeping our arms around the genie that's kind of pretty much out of the bottle. So. Um, I would say that my top considerations for data and analytic programs are certainly number one, keeping up with the regulatory requirement. So we got to keep people out of jail and we don't want organizations to be fined. That's like the baseline that we got to do. Um, seems like regulations, especially when I work globally, uh, regulations are kind of popping up frequently. Um, the other thing is I would say that we should be sort of uh, optimistically but cautious um, around LLMs and AI. We need to make, be sure that we can certify that data, that we understand the data models, that we can track and defend lineage, um, and, and that we're also, we have to do care and feeding of those models as things get more and more complex. They change very rapidly and we need to understand what, why, and how do we need to tune them. Um, I kind of touched on the data sets. I think the acquisition of data to uh, really add more context is another consideration. Um, and really kind of now more than ever, technical and analytic capabilities demand kind of that solid data foundation that, you know, we've got to have our Legos in the right bins. So we have to have a solid data foundation um, as well as that governance foundation. And then the last thing I would say is don't underestimate the uh, need for cultural change um, in the organization. So that, that needs to be something that's kind of top of mind and something we're always looking at um, making a difference in. What do you think, Hafiz? Uh, Sean, uh, those are great points. Uh, 
especially the talk about the culture, uh, acquiring the data sets, et cetera. But I've been in discussion with some of our customers and prospects. I hear traditional, the command and control based data governance, which do not have the agility to meet the needs of the business, especially in this evolving space of data and AI. The common theme I'm hearing is democratization of data and AI. You know, uh, the need here is to provide self-service data and AI, make both of them accessible to a wide range of users, who are not just data scientists or AI experts. There are business users, analysts, sales and marketing personas, and more. So the, the goal is to give them access so that they can get their job done quickly, right? But having that bring its own benefits and ch challenges, right? Benefits such as it helps us, the, it helps organizations to increase accessibility and usability of data and AI. Uh, with that you can you know um, accelerate your innovations and problem solving um, solutions. Of course, you can reduce the cost by having you know, workforce productivity increased. But there are challenges such as data security concerns, for example, right? More accessible, more risk. Uh, but the question is how much you have to control. It's an analogy of having a lot of cash, $1 million, you can keep in your safe and lock it. It is safe, but how do you derive the value out of it? You have to invest it, right? So there are some risks. So finding the right balance between control and accessibility is very important. With that, you know, the, the this emerging trend such as, as you mentioned, the AI, you know, LLMs, usage of generative and corporations, but giving access to data and UI to the consumers is becoming a key factor around data and analytics programs. Oh, indeed. So how can organizations build a strong business justification for holistic data and analytics governance practice? Yeah, so I'll start. I mean, I think that really it's the number one question I get asked by clients is how can we determine and show value for investing in the data program? Um, and that's really kind of for any capability from whether it's integration, observability, or governance, or you know, any of those things. Um, clients are really looking for tying it to ROI and building that justification. Um, at Precisely, we're a bit unique in the kind of data strategy and consulting space because we were founded by a business guy who led the data program for Johnson & Johnson. So we've always been focused on delivering you know, business outcomes aligned to the roadmap for data data people, data processes, and, and technology capabilities. So we really think that you need to take this business first approach. And when we don't, um, organizations really kind of stumble in their programs. A lot of times if people will buy a tool and not really think about, you know, how is this going to make a difference for the business? They're just going to struggle. Um, we really don't really believe in uh, doing data just for the sake of data. We believe in uh, that, that our tools and methods around business objectives, determining um, what business processes are involved, um, and ultimately what data is required, we have to be able to get to the point where we really understand that side of the house to figure out where the concrete value is. And, and we have to get to the point where we're able to measure concretely what the value is for the business in terms of metrics that are tied to the organizational success. So in order to do that, we really need to engage with leadership um, and the business functions to work through. Uh, we do workshops and interviews to determine where those opportunities are and those pain points. And then you have to look at what capabilities are required to prioritize um, in order to get to that quantifiable value of having um, better data, better analytics, better models um, uh, from, from kind of the speed and, and the dollars and cents perspective. So. It really does have to be agreed upon by the organization and it's got to be measurable um, in that in building out that just justification or that business case. Sure. Uh, I just want to queue up uh, reading that I did this last weekend. I was reading, I don't know if you guys know about Ray Kurzweil. He's a writer, inventor, author, futurist. Uh, his paper on insights on AI, where he explains the concept of 
exponential cycle. He talks about how technological programs, progress is not linear, but exponential. In other words, uh, the more advanced technology becomes, the faster it progresses. And the faster it progresses, the more advanced it becomes. This is exactly is what happening now with the evolution of data and AI, right? Our customers uh, are finding it more and more difficult to adapt to the never ending cycle of growth and development in the IT or ID space or data space or AI space, right? And at the same time, they wanna be in the race of highly investing on AI and LLMs or data initiatives so that they can get ahead of the competition by enhancing the customer experience or increasing their innovation and uh, productivity pipelines, right? Reducing the operational costs, et cetera. However, there are challenges. You know that AI can hallucinate. There are bias and fairness issues, explain it, explainability problems, transparency and trust problems. The question here, what I'm thinking is, how do we, how do we help our customers make sure that they use uh, they, their AI is used ethically and legally to drive the business value. How to mitigate problems such as hallucinations, hallucinations and bias and fairness issues. How to increase transparency and trust or ex explainability factor. And the solution is, of course, to extend your governance program to govern your AI initiatives. Right? The bottom line is ensuring trust or transparency of your AI is not just negotiable. Uh, you need to have a strong justification. This is the justification. This use case is one of the best justification for holistic data and analytics practices in your organization. Oh, so very, very true. And we get those questions all the time. You know, it's a great point. Thank you for addressing that. So uh, what organizational models then ranging from centralized to hub and spoke to decentralized um, are most effective for holistic data and analytic governance? Uh, Sean, I can start on this one. This is an interesting model. I've been worked on some of these models in the field when I was um, implementing data governance programs. Uh, I would say Specific model will depend on factors such as um, your organization size, complexity, your domain, your data maturity and risk tolerance, et cetera. Uh, each model has its own strength and weakness I've seen. Um, for example, when I worked uh, in a, with a customer who is in a data sensitivity domain where data is highly sensitive, they uh, have seen success in a centralized or federated model might be you know, um, something that you can think about because you need to worry about the um, openness or you know, consumption of your data where you have a lot of sensitivities um, um, there. And there are customers I've seen um, some of the business units, not, not just customer in one organization, there's a business unit who, who has data with a, with a, which is high risk tolerance, right? In that way, they have created their governance program around centralized model, right? And organizational structure, that's very important. I've seen organizational met metric structure where cross-functional teams are responsible for their own specific data domains, right? In that case, I've seen decentralized or hub and spoke may be more suitable. Then it comes maturity level. I've seen some of our large financial customers who have maturity in the data management space. They have adopted a um, hybrid model, you know, sort of a centralized and, and decentralized model where they could give some controls to business unit, but they should have a federal model to control and command some of the sensitive uh, or risk based data elements. Then the last one is business needs. Uh, I've seen a lot of new age uh, modern data governance approaches where agility and speed to market often favor decentralized or hub, hub and spoke models. So if you have a need where you wanna uh, have, a, and you have a high priority that um, you wanna fast to market your innovations or you wanna uh, find some agility in terms of improving your you know, inno innovations or problem solving solutions, I would say decentralized or hub spoke model favors. But one, one point I have to uh, explain here is regardless of any of these models, there are elements that are crucial to have a robust governance framework, such as you have to think about how do I foster a data-driven culture and 
address the resistance to change problem. That is one of the crucial problems I've seen in the organizations. Uh, change is not easy. We know that. So creating such a collaborative, you know, data-driven culture is one of the very important points. Then how do I utilize tools to automate or augment uh, um, my stewardship management pro processes? That's very critical. So if you buy any tool or any sort of platforms, one thing you have to think about is how do I augment some of this manual creation of documents, policies, assets, linking from business to technology, et cetera. Right? The, one of the very important uh, point in that uh, framework is defining your RACI, you know, um, roles and responsibilities chart. You have to define who owns data, who manages it, and who consumes it. Right? Then comes data quality and data security and privacy elements to that. Yeah, so I, I would just add with these. I, I mean, I think you're right, and and it to me it also de clearly depends on the maturity of the organization because clients just starting out, um, it's going to be more of the the people that understand data governance, the data stewards who are you know hopefully they've got some experience, but they're going to be like go out pulling information to just kind of get the program started, right? So it's more of a a pull. So the way in which we operate our operating models and the organizational model will change over time. So what we do with our clients is we really look at where they are and what's gonna be effective for them. And we uh, fully expect that the model will change. So we talk about it in terms of crawl, walk, run, where crawl is kind of just, you know, let's figure out where you are. So let's assess the current situation. Let's um, do the initial identification of you know, stewardship and technical metadata. What do you have? Do you have data quality framework? What kind of, you know, overall data management framework do you have? And then we'll kind of teach them to fish through, even, even into, you know, like um, working with their data strategy council or their data governance councils, if you will. So it's kind of this crawl, walk, now that we've got an understanding of what this actually means, looks like, touch and feel it. Um, how do we leverage that? How do we expand that? How do we, you know, level up on the maturity of organization? And then once we're running, then, then we can optimize, we can differentiate. But, you know, that takes some time and that, you know, takes some organization. I, I, I use the golf analogy all the time where you can, I see companies go buy a tool and that's like somebody buying a set of golf clubs that has no earthly idea how to play golf. I mean, I could buy the best golf clubs in the world and I am not going to win the master's tournament. I guarantee you that. But, you know, I've got to start with what do the clubs do? How do I do it? I've got to get a coach. I've got to get trained. I've got to have other people a part of the team. I've got to do all of these things. And so really it's almost rules before tools. Like I really should understand the game of golf before I run out and buy a set of golf clubs and figure out where I'm going to play and what that needs to look like. But I guess my point is that the organizational model, I believe, will change over time. And so that's based on the maturity of an organization. But then to your point, it's also kind of as we look to more data mesh and more on the analytics side and data product side, multiple owners and that kind of thing. So it, it will change over time. So, you know, as it's changing, you know, and well, and even as you're deciding, you know, organizational model, then what skills, roles, and team structures are most appropriate for holistic data and analytic governance across hybrid and multi-cloud enterprise computing environments? That's a mouthful of a question. <laughs> exactly. Show <laughs> um, so when we talk about kind of the team and the structures, uh, one thing I would say is, first of all, I have rarely, perhaps never, seen an organization or enterprise succeed with the digital transformation or with their kind of being data-driven culture uh, and advanced analytics and ML and AI without buy-in. I mean, real buy-in from leadership. I don't think, I've been doing this quite a while now, and worked with clients literally all over the world, from Australia to China to Europe, you name it. Um, and, and it's got to be that real buy-in, like that deep understanding that they're going to drive it. I mean, uh, so the CEO at a company I worked with in, in Denmark, he actually, he knew that they had to change. And he knew that it had to come from the top. And so he actually had the Deming quote, in God we trust all others must bring data, right? Like it's got to be that kind of leadership, passion, and commitment behind it. And then I'd say moving from the top, um, going down to the next level of leadership is that the functional business leaders and their key users in the organization um, 
you know, they really need to take the reins. They got to stand up and own the data. The data organization should be heavily weighted um, with business expertise. I mean, business should really lead, not just participate in the process of defining, qualifying and measuring, you know, all the things around data. They've got to ensure that the data is fit for use in the business process. I mean, think about a customer. When a customer starts out as a prospect, the, the, the number of attributes and the accuracy of those, um, when we're just starting out in prospecting, doesn't have to be that accurate. Maybe I just need to know Sean Conley and who he works for so I can find him on LinkedIn. But fast forward to now he's a customer. I got to know a lot about him. I've got to make sure he's not, not tonight party list. I got it really different. So that's why I say it's got to be, you know, kind of fit for purpose. Um, but it's the business that really um, owns the care and feeding of the data. And then I would say, finally, it takes a strong IT organization that are going to work in collaboration with the business since IT owns kind of the capabilities. And as I said, business owns the data. And I would say that really does apply regardless of the complexity of that mouthful and the question that you asked, regardless of the complexity, we need that kind of relationship, that kind of working environment. Um, and, and, and as we get more and more complex then more automation is required to be able to keep up with the speed of change at which data is being uh, created, used, consumed, um, modified, built into models. Models are kicking out new data. So, um, I would say overall the collaboration is important, but kind of those, that's how I think about and how we think about kind of the roles and the team structures and um, building out organizations over time. Great point, Sean. Uh, one point to add is uh, what I'm seeing the shift now in organizations, especially with my previous and current customers. Uh, previously, traditionally we were, we were having this command, command and control approach uh, where focus was more about you know, regulatory complaints, reporting, et cetera. Now with this modern uh, approach to you know, get the value from data and AI, they are adopting collaborate and consume model. That, that's a goal. That shift um, which demands a proactive approach than a reactive one, where leaders from passive to an active role, right, where they should ensure data initiatives directly support strategic goals. That's very number one thing. They want to demonstrate the value of data guns through tangible results. They need to have dashboards of data utilization, right? You know, how consumption is happening with the critical data elements, et cetera. And also they want to foster the cultural you know, change where they want to um, talk about cross-function collaboration and innovation by breaking down silos and promote data sharing. That's a very important point, data sharing. Right. That's why you can see data markets coming, democratization of data is coming, AI. Yep. So all about giving, empower the consumers to get access to the data faster. Right. A again, as Sean said, regardless of any of these skills roles, there are a few things that you consider. And I've seen that in the successful organizations. They always make sure that governance supports business goals. And right. that's very, very important point. Also, Regularly, you have to access and refine your governance processes right? and fostering collaboration among different teams and stakeholders where you identify and mitigate data-related risks. These are very crucial points to consider um, regardless of any tools or skills or you know, structure you build before. Oh, makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we've talked about the the people. So what advanced tools and platforms such as data catalogs, lineage, and impact analysis, metadata manager, retrieval, augmented generation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are best suited to governance of new data and new analytic capabilities or applications, excuse me. I can talk about this. Uh, as I said, I've implemented several Dialogons programs in the industry. So Advanced, I don't know what advanced means, but there are core products that must have, right? For example, an, an enterprise data catalog where uh, a tool or a platform act as a central repository of information of your valuable data assets, right? It is, it is a must for finding your data, understanding your data and accessing your data, right? Th then comes uh, data provenance or lineage or impact analysis or capabilities in the platform where you can track uh, where is my data coming from, where it's going to, who is consuming, consuming it and what transformation is happening on each hops, right? And then the one of the 
most important for data and is data quality, right? Some famous saying, garbage in, garbage out. You have to be very careful about your quality of data that you feed into your AI systems. So ensure, uh, which ensure data accuracy, completeness, consistency, and all those dimensions that we talk about around data quality. And recently we have seen the emergence of data observability where you can detect anomalies and drifts. That's one of the capabilities I would consider in the platform. Then integration, process of combining data from disparate sources into a unified view. You can, um, you might be hearing about data fabric story now, it's emerging, right? Because customers want to get access from a single source without going to the nitty gritty details of writing the query, distribution queries, and you know, provisioning data in some lakes, et cetera. And of course, there are there is always data privacy and security tools, which we should be part of the ecosystem where you have to protect your sensitive data, which and you need to make sure that data complies with regulations. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would add is that it's got to be easy to use. <laughs> I mean, these are complex uh, subjects, and it's not easy to get your Legos in you know the right kind of bins and understand them, right? Um, but I say all the time, I mean, really the power comes from taking really complex things and making them as simple as possible. I mean, nobody taught my wife how to use Amazon and yet packages show up at my house all the time. <laughs> I mean, imagine if, if our data capabilities were easy for people to use. I think I, I just see people overcomplicate, um, you know, their data governance programs, their, their tools, they'll s configure them to the nth degree and it's like, okay, time out. Nobody will use it. We, it it's got to be easy enough for people to use. Um, and, and then you can start to accelerate. And once you get that acumen, once you build that followership, your data maturity increases in your organization. Yeah, then we can start getting fancy. But how about we just deliver some packages? How about we just you know, make it easy for people to use to get that followership and, and to get that understanding in the organization? Uh, well, just add uh, one more point there, Shannon. Yeah. I, I think... Um, did you move or okay? Uh, I was thinking about, I know it was in the previous question, maybe retrieval augmented generation, right? Uh, so I was thinking how it connects to the data governance. Uh, I'm thinking more in terms of context, right? Uh, the the technology is a, te is a technique uh, to enhance the capabilities of generative AI by, you know, uh, incorporating external knowledge sources from you know organization or external resources but why do we do that because all these model foundation models are trained on internet or some data right which doesn't have enough context that's why all the hallucinations or bias problems comes in so to avoid that this technique came in um, which offers a lot of contextual information but how do we find this context information how do we connect things there should be knowledge. That's where this knowledge graph concepts is coming into the practice now. You know, it was academia before. Now I'm seeing that uh, development uh, in the corporate world where they want to create more contextual information. They want to connect you know, nodes and edges to make sure that you understand your data in terms of its relevance, its use, et cetera. Right? So that, that is a very important point, which I missed in the previous question. So when you think about AI, when you think about RAG or GRAG, which is the next version, graph retrieval augmented, where you can even feed knowledge graph into the um, RAG um, architecture, where it has more confidence now, more trust and transparency on you, what you are going to answer for your prompts. Oh yeah, Hafiz, thank you so much for adding that. Um, you know, we have about seven minutes. I'm gonna try and slip in as many of our plan questions, but do you wanna have leave about 10 minutes for a Q&A from the community? Um, I see y'all have been submitting some great questions so far, so feel free to put those in the Q&A panel. I'll get to those here shortly. Um, so, you know, uh, then, you know, building your data, you know, what personalized dashboards then do business and technical stakeholders require to track relevant data and analytics governance metrics and do their most, uh, and do their jobs most effectively? Uh, I can give a few examples uh, from the personal experience. Um, I mean, personalized dashboards are essential. We know that um, for you know, any effective data or analytics or AI governance. The goal here is to provide with a clear uh, and concise view of your uh, metrics that matter most to your jobs, right? So 
business, if you take business, business stakeholders, they, they are primarily focusing on the impact of uh, data on the business outcomes, which are already defined as their goals. Their dashboard should provide um, high level overview of data quality, accessibility, data utilization, reg regulatory complaints, and return on investment of their data initiatives. So these are evolving dashboards that I'm seeing in the market, right? For business stakeholders, then th then comes technical um, partners, where they are focused on operation operational aspects of um, data. Uh, they they need dashboards to provide detailed insights uh, into data infrastructure, data processes, pipelines, right? Data security and performance to know what's going on wrong or how do we proactively identify why. Um, then there are common dashboards. There are common dashboards shared between both stakeholders where you should um, have KPIs, key performance indicators, right, to measure the progress towards your goals. That's very important because everyone has goals defined up front. Then you talk about how do I measure it? So a dashboard, uh, KPI dashboard is one of the critical dashboards um, I'm, I'm seeing people are using in the organizations. Then there are you know, real-time alerts, notifications, you know, and data visualization for it. You, 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 should, you want to learn about your data. You want to know how the statistical distribution is happening around it. So data visualization is a common tool I'm seeing across. These are the few things that will come in on top of my head. Uh, Sean, if you have anything else. Yeah, I'll be quick because I know we want to get moving on. But I mean, really, it's about what are we doing? How are we doing? What's changing? And are we making an impact? And so we work with clients to build out metrics um, specifically in kind of three hour areas. One's efficiency and effectiveness. So kind of the basic volume, cycle counts, cycle times, kind of the base level. Are we efficient at what we do? And are we effective? The next is performance and value. So are we, do we have errors? What's our cycle time? What's our productivity? And then the highest level um, we work at, well, on is more kind of the business impact. Um, so these are process enablement type of uh, measures, KPIs, PPIs, looking at um, customer satisfaction and, and kind of overall uh, acceleration of projects and analytics for the business. So I'll just kind of keep my answer to that, <laughs> keep it brief so we can answer other questions. Well, I love it. I am going to get to the next question here because um, we've got about three minutes, but, uh, and, and then I will get to the Q and A, but um, we get, I want to make sure I get to this because we get this question all the time, you know, how can organizations measure the maturity of their data governance programs and what metrics should they track? Yeah, so we touched on the metrics a little bit, but um, so we, we've got a process that we use that we're, we're assessing an organization's um, maturity because you have to have that red dot on the map. I mean, you want to go to Europe, but you know, you got to know where you are. <laughs> if I take an airplane, a train, how am I going to get there? So we have a process uh, that clearly defines um, how we look at maturity. And it's really kind of a mix of some of the models that are out there because we tend to take a very, like I said, business focus. So we leverage models like Gartner has and Dama has and other folks um, where we're looking at organizational data ownership. We're looking at you know the framework that they've got in place for governance and for their data and analytics. We look at the operating model that they have for governance. We look at um, performance measures uh, qualitative and qualitative and kind of that three levels that I described. We're going to look at supporting tools and systems and capabilities. We can look at quality of execution. Um, culture and people is a big one of them. Um, and, and we're looking at the um, also an enterprise data model. Do they even have one? How do they um, add and delete and change? Um, we're looking at dis digital business models and use cases. Um, and, and even do they have a monetization strategy for their data? But um, like, as I mentioned before, from a metric standpoint, more mature organizations will have uh, their um, broader, a broader organizational tie or link to those key measures um, instead of just the typical data quality and governance and, and those types of measures. So overall, that's kind of how we approach it. Um, super critical to know where you are and, and get organizational buy-in. Change management is a huge part of that to get the organization um, to want to do it instead of sort of need to do it. Big difference in how people react and invest. I trust Sean on this because that's what he does. <laughs> <laughs> we do this a lot with <laughs> Well, I love it so much. Okay, well, uh, I am going to, oh, I wish we could have, uh, I, I do want to get to the attendee questions because we've got a lot coming in and I'm going to leave this up um, so y'all can um, scan the QR code. Who doesn't love a good QR code? 
code. Uh, so, uh, you know, and just to answer the most commonly questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow up email by end of day uh, Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and the recordings. So diving in here, Sean and Hafiz, what is the best way to anticipate the business needs with respect to data and get that data ready to answer the business questions? Yep. So the roadmap that I talked about, uh, too many places I go, they have a data strategy that's like slides. And uh, that helps. That's helpful to get you directionally that I want to go to Europe. It doesn't help me get how I'm, how I'm going to get there, when I'm going to get there, what capabilities do I need, and that kind of thing. So you have to have that roadmap. And that roadmap, we go and we do workshops and we do interviews with leadership and with functional um, leaders and uh, uh, heavy data users. And we're going to identify what their objectives are. So if my objective is to reduce my cost of goods sold, that's going to help me understand what business processes we need to look at, what data they're going to need in those business processes, um, what how they're going to measure that, and then I can drill that all the way down to data. And we really look at it at, at three levels you got to be able to accomplish. You really have to be able to respond and have a plan from the top down. So a leader says, hey, I want to be carbon neutral by 2030. Okay, that's great, but what what are the goals and objectives? It's water usage, it's fuel, it's all these things. How are we going to measure that? And that will drive us all the way down to the data that's going to be ready and the capabilities that we have to have to do that. You got to be able to go middle out. Somebody says my go-to-market process takes too long. From the time I mix up a new oatmeal to the time it gets out the door takes too long. Well, that's a business process that also is going to drive capabilities, critical data elements, and, and having good data around that. And then, then you got to also be able to go bottom up where you just have bad vendor data or you have bad customer data. How do I clean that up? Where is that going to drive value in the organization? And again, always tying it to those measures. So super important to let the business drive and ensure that our roadmap and our capabilities are aligned to that those value drivers. That's good advice. Hafiz, anything you want to add? I think, uh, yeah, great point. I mean, business has to drive uh, um, initiatives around data and AI, but uh, what I'm thinking a small different uh, you know, approach that I'm seeing is, uh, as John, you mentioned, top-down approach, where you know uh, it's all about controlling or making sure that data is safe, top-down approach in the traditional way of doing. But it's now all about making that accessible and augmenting the data stewardship process. The augmentation is a great uh, you know, word that I, I, I talk about because you know initially it was you know, finding a re complaints requirements or some reporting critical data elements, have some guardrails you know, defined around it, make sure that you, know, you um, grow from there, expand, right? Based on your business requirements. Now the data is exploding, the AI is evolving. You know that the world ha has changed, but our processes hasn't, our processes are not changing. That's a problem, right? So with that, what the problem is to our ship. For example, as a data stewards, I come to my um, tool, I see millions of metadata in catalog where I have glossary of hundreds of items. How do I connect now? That's because linkage is becoming a biggest problem. Plus, automating uh, writing business definitions or descriptions, or you know, creating business rules automatically. That's why AI is very powerful now. There are opportunities to use AI to augment some of these. But when I say augment, it's not automate. Man in the middle, right? You cannot automate these things. There has to be a man in the middle to review, approve, to have sort of workflow to make sure that you know it is aligned with the business goals. Very good point. You know, change is, is here, and but it's so hard. Um, so uh, speaking of change, you know, how do you recommend we introduce and implement data governance into a 60 year plus organization for the first time ever? We, we first, uh, what first few initial steps would we need to take? Me and my team are kind of lost ever since our management asked us a couple of months ago to to start this. Yeah. So first of all, data governance, least sexy term on the planet. Uh, I hate the term, whoever came up with it, don't like it. So, you know, we, we talk about, you know, data excellence, data integrity. We're not there to govern. We're there to make a difference with the data. And so starting with, um, you know, I work with a lot of companies that are uh, very mature, very old organizations, kind of traditional. And you have to talk to the business in their terms. Um, if a data person goes and asks a 
head of sales or a data person or uh, somebody else in the business head of purchasing, how can I help you with your data? I guarantee they're going to come back with, can I get that report daily instead of weekly? Or can you add this dimension or that dimension or some, some type of categorization? That is not at all the point. Their goals and objectives, I mean, when we know what their goals and objectives are and we do the translation to what the data is, we can understand how big of a difference. When we show them in Denstreet that we can help them achieve their goals and objectives, they're all in. But at the end of the day, I mean, you got to make people understand what in the world we're talking about. That's why I use the Lego slide, frankly, is because it like kind of breaks things down and makes it like, oh, well, that's what it is. Um, the other thing we do is like we'll do um, we'll do a strategy roadmap and an assessment, and we always tie it to a use case. I don't like to go to organizations and, and just have the outcome be PowerPoint because that doesn't bring it to life. Like this is such a weird topic. Like, what does it even mean, data governance, data excellence, data integrity? So we have to make it real for an organization. And we have to show that we're going to deliver value when we start investing in capabilities and people and, and going down that road. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, it's got to be business driven and you got to get people to get it. You got to get them to care. Mm, it's so true. Hafiz? I would say um, one of the things is gaining an executive sponsorship. Right, determine who will be impacted by data governance and secure their support first. Right, then communicate that or articulate that vision and benefits of data governance, um, you know, such as improved decision making, cost reduction, risk mitigation, etc. Then you have to go back and assess your current trade. As you said, it's starting from scratch, right? It has a lot of data, a lot of complexity around the data management processes. So assess your current state, make sure where you are. Right then, define your governance objectives based on the use cases. Use cases very important business use cases. Right? As Sean said, it has to align with your business goals. So align with your business goals. Set clear expectations. Establish your metrics first. Define a IC chart. You know who owns and who is responsible and accountable and informed as well. Then, uh, as I said, start small, scale up. You know, you cannot start, uh, you know, boiling the ocean data ground. It's very complex. You have to start very small, focus on high impact areas first. Prioritize your data governance initiatives based on business value and risk, for example, right? And start a pilot project. Implement uh, pra um, data governance practices in specific departments or areas, right? First, you start in silos, then make sure that you find the success. I, it is an iterative improvement. Continuously evaluate and refine the program. And that, that's what I do for a company who hasn't done forever. You know, three things, as I said, executive sponsorship, then start small scale up or, you know, assess the current state and define where you are going. It's, it's, it's going to a destination, right? You put some address, you know which route. So you yep. know where to go. If you do not know the destination, you're going to get stranded. Mm. The, only, the only thing I would add is I've been to places that are even worse than that and help them get along the journey. Because imagine this 60-year-old company and they've just thrown away $300 million in a data program. That takes a lot of change and it takes a lot of convincing. You got to work with leadership. You know, why should you invest? What, what should you do? This was a $7 billion company we went in and, and I worked with various parts of the business and ended up that I had the CEO and his leadership team really understanding that they were missing out on about a half a point of revenue to the bottom line, which is $35 million. Mm -hmm. So do you think they're going to invest in, you know, some data governance some data quality, a, a, a small, I mean, of course they're going to go after, uh, you know, 35 million bucks to the bottom line. Oh, absolutely. When you can show the ROI. Oh my gosh. So many great questions coming in here. We have less than two minutes. I'm wondering if I can get your elevator pitch on this last one. I'm going to slip one more in here. Um, so we talk about data, but in organizations, data resides in, in multiple systems, you know, HR system, payroll, SEM, patient data care. So how do we go about having a data governance around the, all those data systems? Yeah, I mean, it's really kind of, you have to have an overall data strategy across the entire enterprise, not just by system, not just by function, but it's gotta be an enterprise wide, this is what we're gonna do and go after. Now, the first place that you might start, like I worked with a client in the Philippines and we were brought in by the HR team, 
they were a big conglomerate and they had needs across their airline, their banks, their retail, and you know they knew that HR was a challenge across those. So it could be a domain function, but you just have to start with those business use cases and frankly, where you get some buy-in. And, and, and to Hefe's point, where can you make a big difference? Um, and then I would just add that I'm always looking for a use case that is fairly cross-functional, that when, when you're a data person, you know that it's not that hard <laughs> because you wanna make a big difference across the organization as wide as you can and with the biggest value, but it's gotta be something that's achievable as well. Uh, it makes sense. And I'm so sorry, but we are out of time. That is uh, all the time we have. It's been such a pleasure, both of you. Sean, Hafiz, thank you so much thanks for this for great everyone. conversation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, 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 and to all of our attendees out there, thanks for being so engaged in everything we do. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email within the next uh, two business days by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all- If you have any questions to us, please you know, contact us. We're going to give better clarity on the questions. Absolutely. Yeah, I will uh, make sure and get your uh, your info out there. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everyone.